part 7 of data visualization and R and in this section we're going to look at categorization methods, clustering trees and as we mentioned earlier uh, these are really just going to be uh, very brief introductions to a quite large area that I don't pretend that this is comprehensive but just to give you a feel of some of the things that that can be done so we're gonna look at trees we're gonna look at self-organizing maps we're gonna look at clustering and there are many other tools and methods available uh, in R and in other software that I'm really not going to get into detail about you can look at the cluster analysis page um, or some of the tools that are on um, the the CRAN task views page um, for some other ideas and again I just want to give you a sense of those possibilities so we are now in section 4.8 of the R code and we're going to start with the tree plot. So there's a package in R called the party package um, and the party package has a built-in data example that I'm just going to run the, the standard example here and plot it and talk through it a bit. So a tree is a straightforward classification method that starts to ask questions about which how do you, can you split your data to generate final result sets that are significantly different from each other. Um, and in this example we're thinking about air quality and the measurement at the bottom is actually a measure of ozone or you know pollution in in the air and you read these just like you would a decision tree so we start out at, at the first node if the temperature is less than 82 we go down this branch on the left if the temperature is greater than 82 we go down the branch on the right and then we check the wind speed if the wind speed is high greater than 10 and the temperature is high we're in this situation at the bottom right and there the ozone is moderate not too high it's around 50 if the wind speed is low and the temperature is high the ozone gets very high and it's up closer to uh, mean of 75 and up near 100 uh, in many cases over on the left hand side of the tree when the temperature is low and the wind is low the ozone is moderate but contained if the wind is high uh, it turns out that in that case it makes sense to split the data again and ask whether the temperature is lower than 77 or higher than 77 because those two groups have significantly different outcomes. If your temperature is low, lower than 77 and the wind is high, um, the, the ozone is minimal. So again we have this combination of we're seeing the distribution of our data, we're seeing the clusters, but we're also seeing these decision points that were used to create the clusters all in one combined uh, visualization guide to how that works. So that is uh, a visualization of one classification method, the tree plot. Um, another method uh, is the self-organizing map. Now the, again my discussion of the the methods here is very brief and sketchy uh, but a self-organizing map uh, is a way to take a data set and just interrogate it to find the measures that that cause the data to cluster into similar groups and it does not have it, an inherent meaning um, it's up to the person interpreting it to see if those clusters uh, make some kind of interpretive sense. So there's a package again SOM for self-organizing maps 
and this is an example that you can run from there. Uh, the data underlying this are actually economic data about countries of the world and you'll notice that the plot is very abstract. It just has dimension 1 and dimension 2 along the sides and it's showing these color-coded groups are things that are similar according to the algorithm that has gone in and, and analyzed the data. Um, and these letters are country codes. So I'm just really showing you this as a brief example to show you that there's a lot of different things that can come out of a, a visualization. Uh, Cajonan is the name of, the per of a person who was uh, very influential in developing self-organizing maps. There is uh, another package called Cajonan and this process again takes existing data and goes through a training algorithm to figure out which clusters are stable and divide the data up in a, in a way that separates them according to the mathematical measures. So here's a plot of the the training convergence and then we can plot the results of the Cajonan map. Now this data, sample data that's uh, in the Cajonan package is a set of data on wines and their chemical composition and so it finds these 25 clusters uh, and it's clustered them according to different characteristics so some of them have um, you know let's say high alcohol and high phenols others are low in those same things and if you look at, you can again work your way through these categories to see if any of them uh, would cars if, if there was someone who had wine knowledge might be able to recognize some of these characteristics um, but you can certainly see that each of the cells or circles indicating the clusters has a, a s very different sort of profile uh, in terms of chemical composition and it turns out that these these are also split into three major groups. Uh, there, there are those groups are mostly separated, except there's a sort of a catch-all category in the center where you know some of those things overlap. And we can also show the number of observations that fall into each category. Here, so these are not actually that many wines in each um, in each category, especially some of these ones in the in the bottom left and over on the right. Um, again, you have to know your data, know how to interpret some of these things, and actually spend some time tuning these models um, to find. You know, we just sort of randomly said generate 25 categories. That may not be the right number of categories to, to use. Uh, only working with the data will produce some meaning from these classification methods. But again, I just want to show you some quick examples so that you get a sense of uh, what is possible in terms of classification. All right, so the next thing we'll talk about are clustering algorithms and a little bit of ways to visualize those. So uh, we're going to, in section 4.10, we are going to take a, a small sample of the diamonds data. The reason we're taking a sample will become obvious in a second. And we're going to run a clustering algorithm using the HC Lust um, method h clust and this is going to generate a classification based on in this case the 50 diamonds that we have um, pulled as a sample so each observation these numbers at the bottom are the the row IDs from our sample now if we had run the clustering on the entire 
diamonds data set, we would have an indistinguishable mass of black down here for all those observations. In terms of a graphical method, this dendrogram is only going to make sense for a limited number of observations. But the dendrogram attempts to illustrate the major groupings uh, that the algorithm has found in the data. And then we can um, show, for example, if we want to plot the five most significant clusters of data, um, we can actually draw little boxes around them and show that these were identified by the algorithm as being five similar groups of diamonds. Um, so that's what's known as Ward hierarchical clustering and the illustration of a use of a dendrogram. Okay, so those are our categorical methods. Um, now we're going to move to a, a more uh, simple but flexible method that can be used for categorical data called the mosaic plot. Now th this is um, something that I'll spend a little bit more time on because uh, we can illustrate several dimensions of it. And I'm going to use a package in R called VCD. There are, are other ways to do mosaic plots. There's a basic command in base R um, I like the VCD package. It has a few more options, so we're going to work with that. And we're going to use data. Uh, the data that we're going to use is the Titanic, Titanic data set, and that's the number of survivors survived, and those who did, did and didn't survive the wreck of the Titanic. So uh, you can see if I just print those tables out, we have uh, children by sex um, and class of passenger who survived who didn't um, and it's it's actually a, a small but straightforward um, data set the class of the passenger, the sex of the passenger, and the age of the passenger are the only um, characteristics, and then the output is really whether they survived or not. So that's what we're going to try to plot, and we just do that with um, the oops, the mosaic command, and so mosaic. Uh, uses this functional notation. If I just do mosaic tilde survived, this is basically asking only for the proportion of people who survived on the Titanic. And so we get a giant box with uh, roughly a third or less who survived and the remaining proportion who did not survive. Now this is not very interesting, it's not a very attractive graph, um, probably not something that you'd want to use the mosaic plot for. Mosaic comes into its own when we start to add more categories. So here we have uh, sex versus survival. And we can see that um, the top section are males. And we read this in multiple dimensions. So uh, the proportion along the left-hand vertical axis is males versus females. We can see that there were many more males on board than females. Although, like all of the mosaic uh, um, versions, we're not seeing uh, a numerical proportion. We don't get to see the detail here. We just see the loose visual representation of it. Um, so we read that axis as proportion by sex, and then we read the, the horizontal axis as the proportion who survived. So among males, m most did not survive. The, the, the yes are those who survived. Among females, the proportion who survived is much higher. It's maybe close to three-quarters of the females who survived 
Titanic. And you're maybe wondering about the colors here, the blue and the red. The dark blue and dark red means that it's a very statistically significant effect, that this is a pattern that was not random. Uh, it means something that these proportions are different. And that's what the shading uh, comes into play here. Now we can continue with the mosaic plot. We can continue to add categories. So if we add age as well, we get a plot that, sh that throws in another layer. The We've got sex on one side, child versus adult along the, the, the top horizontal axis, and then survival itself um, along the, the remaining right-hand side axis. So um, several things going on at once, um, but it, at this level we can, you know, still see those patterns. We can see the, the standard uh, improvement in survival for females versus males. And, but we can also see there was something going on with the children as well. Um, male children were significantly more likely to survive than the adults. Uh, there really weren't that many male children on board proportionally, uh, but we, we can start to see that. But if you, and you can add as many variables as you like However, you reach a point of sort of diminishing returns. Here we've added the class of passenger as well. And then that generates some quite small slices of data that are hard to interpret. But we can still, we can see some things from this graph. We can see this big group are the male crew members, male adult crew members, and among that group, uh, many more perished than survived. Uh, and we can see this improvement in survival as we reach the first classes, especially the first class females were very likely to survive. First class adult females had a pretty good good shot on the Titanic. Um, and you can then, this make graph may be a bit complicated, but you can adjust the order and um, way that those parameters display to try to get something that really makes your point. So if I'm really just looking at the class differences on the Titanic, I might want to put class along the top and and then I can see that survival um, survival was actually uh, not particularly high among the second and third class male passengers was better among the crew than the second and third class male passengers, uh, but survival followed a more predictable pattern for the uh, the females, with the highest survival at first class and then sort of declining as you went in second and third class. So that's the mosaic plot. You can again play with it to get different combinations. There's a nice, there's a sweet spot in the middle where you're looking at two, three, four things simultaneously that it can make a point and it can be either too simple or too complex if you if you go too far. Now we also have a version of this that I'm just going to mention called the spine plot. The spine plot is like a bar chart, like a stacked bar chart the only difference is that the width of the bar is proportional to the number of observations or the size of the population. So I'm illustrating this one by going back to our diamonds data and we can see the proportion of ideal cut diamonds increases as we get higher clarity ratings, right? People like to um, Perhaps they invest more effort in getting the cut just right if the diamond is already really clear and really nice. Maybe that's the effect. Anyway, we can see that pattern. But we can also see that overall there are really very few IF, internally flawless diamonds, the perfect ones, or very few really low, low rated diamonds. The vast majority of diamonds are really in the middle. And if that's something you want to convey in addition to these proportions, you can use the spine plot command. So the, 
the effect is similar to that of the mosaic plot uh, where the the size of the boxes is, is, is meaningful in terms of the size of the population but it's arranged slightly differently. Um, and in the code you can play around with the other versions of mosaic. Uh, I do like VCD the best uh, but if you find those others ha meet your needs you can try those as well. All right. Now the last bit that we're going to look at in terms of categorical data is the timeline package. Now you, you say well what is that? A timeline is a timeline. Uh, it's just that in a sense a timeline is also categorical data where the categories um, are the pieces of the timeline that something may belong to. So this example with the timeline package uh, just shows us what we can do and if you look at the underlying data it's a very simple it's just got what we're doing is plotting the leaders of different countries versus um, events and time periods during World War II so we've got the term of Franklin Roosevelt the term of Harry Truman the term of our UK leaders and the duration of the war itself and just by formatting those and running it through the timeline package we um, can map it like this and then we can also link it to events that are at specific points so if we look at the WW2 events file we'll see it's also in this timeline format um, but it's it's got some longer labels for the events and they don't have a duration they don't have a start and end they have a just a a point date um, but the categories really would be here the the that Franklin Roosevelt is in the category US president and Winston Churchill is in the category UK prime minister um, again just just another thing to think about when you are visualizing your data so I think this is another good spot to take a break um, this is going to be followed with a very short video on maps in in R uh, and that will kind of conclude